1950, two suddenly grew up to be a papa's son right fast. I was successful in getting out of the service in 1946, married Olga Gay Cottony, and in 1951, somebody kicked the filing cabinet and my name fell out, and they called me back in the service. I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and was assigned to a searchlight unit to reactivate one there and then go to Korea to take over one already in active duty there. En route to Korea, they changed my orders and I went to the 809th Aviation Engineer Battalion instead. Then I didn't know what a searchlight unit was. And you say you flick your bick today, but I didn't know how to flick that unit over there. And I was glad that they transferred me into the aviation engineer. Now this is when I first got there in June of 1952. And I started growing a mustache, as you can see, that did reach 14 and a half inches before I got home in March of 1953. <coughs> Lieutenant Meeker was my executive officer and one of the finest officers I ever knew in front of our order room. We did have to have some assistance and we got it from the Air Force since I was working for the Air Force there and this is a station that they had at uh, Pusan, Korea and uh, I was doing the work down there and I was able to be able to get transportation by the base operations officer if I do certain works for them which we did in my unit. That is typical of the the uh, airfield down in Korea. It was on a marine base at Pusan. We had to pour concrete in freezing weather, and the only way we could do it was to cover it, as you can see, with straw, hoping to keep it from freezing. It was a rather difficult job to do. These are the typical tents that my men had to live in, and we used for all of our storage area also. Then in March of 1953, we thought our third son, Chris, was going to die at about nine months old because we had lost our first son, Keith, with cancer. So the Red Cross actually got me transferred back in March. And I refer to this as the Red Cross deportation log. It was so muddy, you couldn't even walk across the street, so the men pitched a log down there so they could haul my baggage off that way. <coughs> Excuse me. This is another shot of our supply depot. It was about the only thing in the world that we had, I and mean, they had to cover it up with canvas to keep it going. And that's the way they repaired the airplane. They couldn't get a hangar big enough, so they just built a little shed and stuck it in. Pilots again taking us wherever we needed to go. That happens to be in uh, the Air Force barracks in Japan where I was lucky enough to be able to fly over and pick up stuff. And that's one of the places there. A good shot of the runways again. Big repair job going on here. We're looking at Korea from the air. There's the big cargo planes that hold everything for us. That's another shot of the order room, except we got two of my officers there now. And these are the people that would fly me around wherever I needed to go. And it's funny, but Eddie Rickenbacker Jr., a second lieutenant, actually was my, shall we say, cab driver by air. He flew me most anywhere I needed and wanted to go whenever. More runways we're having to do. Other officers. Another barracks in Japan. They even grew oranges there, as you can see. 
city streets in Japan then weren't all quite that uh, crowded. Japanese pagoda. Control tower on the air base. More barracks in Japan. Tokyo Base Exchange. It wasn't very big, was it? it been back to K-6. We're still pouring runway. That was my first sergeant, Bryant, in Korea. <clears throat> More runways. Then we jumped to Newfoundland because they sent me up there from Korea after I was successful in rotating in March. We were blasting bog on the Anson Memorial Highway from Stephenville to Stephenville Crossing. And we were having to drain the water. It was nothing but bog, anywhere from 18 inches to 18 feet deep. And it was difficult to get the water to run off. Now, if you don't think that one was stuck, you ought to just try to remember how effort it took to pull that thing out. It took six cats and an air compressor before we could get it out. More work on that road. Corduroy roads to get our equipment across. <coughs> Excuse me. Blasting rock. Starting into a bog area, we soon learn. Instead of trying to remove it, just pile dirt on it and push it out. And just keep pushing. That's a 50-ton rock crusher we had to carry wherever we wanted to go. It was one of our table of basic equipment pieces we had ourselves. This is the side of a 150-ton rock crusher that we used down by Noel's Pond. We're heading toward what they call Cold Duck Creek, trying to get a culvert in, as you see there. The road now, we have done some pretty well finishing of it about sometime in 1955 was when this picture was taken. And another shot of Noel's Pond where the 150-ton rock crusher was. Again, about 1955. That was when I had gone into the 347th Engineer Aviation Battalion from Orlando, Florida in uh, June of 1953, we went up there. We also built the base salvage yard. That's the entrance to it. And again, we were getting awfully lot of vehicles stuck, as you can see. It was a mess. The most expensive real estate that the United States Army, I think, ever had anywhere was 37 acres in the entire area, but it was millions of dollars per acre in cost. Then we just filled up some of the holes after we got stuck up on the salvage yard with dirt, as you can see, stumps, rocks, you name it. Then we had to dig the basements, pour the concrete footings, blocks to raise the Butler buildings that we had to have. And then winter hit us in 1953-54. It was necessary, however, that we had to pour concrete. So, yep, we built a shed over it, canvas, put heaters in it, and kept working. Lieutenant sometime argue a little bit. That was Captain Gomez, who had Company E of our battalion. Sergeant Snyder is the man on the right with his shirt still on. He was my master sergeant and the operations officer when I became major and was the operations officer for the battalion. 
in finishing up this work. We're having to build a bridge now at Cormier Village, because the only good stream we had coming out of Noel's Pond. <coughs> there was a couple of shots of the same in here that, well, you can't be perfect. That's the first one I showed you about blasting in Newfoundland, but there it is again. That was the 1954 shots we're trying to get started. We're putting a sub base here on the road before finishing it. Big cover to Cold Duck Creek. And it even had to be worked in when it was snow and ice. We finally got it across the road, however. Again, they're going to argue. Lieutenant O'Keefe on the right, one of my best officers. Captain Gomez at another spot. Now we've got the Butler buildings so you can recognize them. And when they were finished, we had 39 of them. Now we're getting a shot of the base back in those days. And that's a fire drill that they were having in 1954 from where I'd put in. The base did not have housing facilities for all of its men, and I put in a base trailer, not a base, but an off-base trailer park, the first on the, the um, west coast of Newfoundland and operated while I was on active duty. Naturally, they had to have uh, fire drills to keep us safely as we were going around with everything. If I can record on my camcorder the eight millimeter movies that I took in 1952, starting 53 and so forth in the later years in the service. At the moment, we're looking at the barracks. I was able to get transferred to the 347th Aviation Engineers in uh, March of 1953 because of Captain Fulmer, the adjutant, and I had served in the 360th in World War II for the Third Army. We're now getting ready to load on train in Orlando Air Force Base at the station to go to New York to catch a boat to go to Ernest Harmon Air Force Base in Stephenville, Newfoundland. And this is the process of getting everything lined up. I was a train master, as they call them in those days, responsible for all the supplies and et cetera. And of course, I had my little dog, Ola, that used to help me do all the cattle raising back in Clay County, Alabama. We managed to make it then, unload it to dock, getting ourselves aboard a ship, or actually a tugboat to take us out to the ship. They even had a band to tell us goodbye, like we were going into a war. In some respects, it was. A war with nature in Newfoundland. That's the harbor as we aboard our ship, leaving out. And it was full of other ships, of course.
the boat, Captain. <coughs> These are the BOQs at Ernest Harmon Air Force Base when we arrived there in June of 1953. There will be a lot of general shots. It won't be necessary to have too much comments concerning as it was fairly well laid out, well constructed, and very comfortable quarters. The base was surrounded on the south and east with hills, they called them mountains there, but they weren't very really high, and to the west was St. George's Bay and looking down toward the north or up toward the north was Piccadilly area and small sections and islands, Fox River, where a lot of good fishing went on. I'm up on top behind the hospital looking down, taking a general shot of the BOQ area now looking down toward the city itself and back to the housing area. Tank farm. finish up work on these barracks. They were relatively new. Paving hadn't been completed. Of course, landscaping was not done. The older section where you can see their lawns had been sodded. These is where our companies moved into. Those are the hills they referred to as mountains back then. About 5,000 military personnel here. And with their dependents and families, it would be an approximately 10,000 Americans. More than half of them had to have housing in the city of Stephenville, so the base housing did not furnished sufficient for that many as half of them. Housing was in quite a shortage in 1953. Now this is in the winter of 53 and when the snow hit and we're in the city of Stephenville itself now on Main Street with Nelson Shiflett, who later went in business with me and robbed me blind when I opened the first laundromat in Newfoundland. snow still in the city of Lincoln, Stephenville here and my dog were rode on top and that was the name of King
This dog didn't like us outside taking pictures. Just a little old country town, but they were getting a lot of money from the GIs there. This is Cormier's Hotel. He, at that time, was about the wealthiest man in Stephenville. Of course, having uh, 23 kids might have had something to do with it. That's Russell's plumbing. And he had uh, only trailers, but it wasn't a park. Each man had to go in and dig his own uh, septic tank, put it in, drill a well to get water, and put his own electricity in. And not too many GIs could afford to do that. That's what motivated me to put in the first trailer park, which I did, and I had 46 trailers moved in there. And we constructed that and built it from July of 1953 until the middle of August it was completed. Of course, they kind of referred to me as somebody robbing the base to do all that, but I didn't. I paid for everything. Incidentally, we're looking at the main entrance to the base in 1953. Wasn't that something? This is up Moonshine Valley Road, looking north. Now I'm looking toward the east. And the Air Police Headquarters building, there she comes, right there. You had to go in there to get passes to get people to go into the base that didn't have a decal on the car. Beautiful, lovely weather. That's the base theater. Cost all of a quarter in those days. Looking back toward town. And then looking up toward the base headquarters. What a beautiful school they had. There is your base headquarters, right there. Looking down toward the runways and the buildings that we had to use as an office. Now this is in the winter of 1954 after Bicky was born in September, and the two little boys are chasing around with Daddy looking at the, the uh, sign while Mama's taking the movies. My company D headquarters and men lived in this building here. And that was the base, shall we say, officers' quarters. The VIPs lived in this particular spot. Then we had to go, or I did, had to go to North Sassawak, which this is, BW1, North Sassawak, Greenland, into BW8, which was Sondestrom. I had to be up there in July, the latter part of July, 1953, to uh, do the work for them up there. Colonel Germain, our battalion headquarters, said it wasn't going on good enough, and I had to hightail it up to do something about it. I don't know what all I did, but I sure did have to nearly freeze myself. Sight of the first icebergs that even I had ever seen, taking shots from the plane. This is after we got left North Sassabach going into Sonnestrom. There were a few of them. And some of the big ones would be no more than it would take to get to Titanic again.
Now we're approaching the landing area in Sandestrom. That is a shot of our equipment. We had to build buildings as well as patch runways and extend the runway, and we could only do it July, August, and September. And even then, at night, it would be way down below freezing. Barren is the word. It was only used, really, as a fuel stop, which was necessary in those days as the planes weren't capable of flying all the way across the ocean. They had to pick up gas, and they hadn't even gotten tankers ready to fill them at that point. Those tents are where my men lived when we were up there. And that's our warehouse area. Shot of the runway we were having to patch. They did have a few mountains there. Most of them, of course, as you see, bare. Literally no trees, just a little bit of grass and a few weeds and flowers in the spring. In that little lake there, you could catch some of the best Arctic char, and we did do it quite often. Now we have jumped back into Newfoundland. This is Temple Air Force Base over at St. John's, Newfoundland. And uh, this is Lake Queedy Vidi, they call it, Queedy Vidi. Only little seaplanes would take off from that. And it was about 10 miles from the Temple Air Force Base to where we had the runways for the aircraft to go. But that was the capital of Newfoundland, so politics still plays a lot in the military. In fact, it's always played a lot. Quite a nice little plane. Couldn't have got more than one big moose in that, could he? But they sure went moose hunting from those planes. Now we're coming back to Ernest Harmon Air Force Base, looking at the runways in the winter and the equipment that we had to have to clean it. The tank farm down at Port Harmon where the ships came in. We're back into Stephenville now. That was the grossetier that we had in old days. Dress shop. Now this would be in 1954 here. There's a better shot of the gross material. The Russell service station. He was a brother to the Russell's plumbing shop. Both quiet characters. Incidentally, Gus Russell at the plumbing shop, they had 19 children. There's old King up on top, and of course, the king of all whiskey bottles for the GI. This is the winter of 54. Looking across Moonshine Valley Road from Stephenville. Looks like a lake, but it's just frozen ground. Uh, 
I suppose you'd say that since these were taken in 1953 and 4, they've held up pretty well. We've moved to Cornerbrook, Newfoundland now, which is about 64 miles from Stephenville, going up north. And that is the largest pulpwood mill in the world, Bullwater's Pulpwood Mill there. That is at that time. Again, this is 1954. And they did have a lot of pulpwood in that pile. Going into the Glen Mill Inn, which was the number one spot in Cornerbrook, of course, five-star hotel. Not half as good as the home of the priest, though. That Catholic priest was doing okay, wasn't he? Quite a nice garden area he had. This is shots of Cornerbrook itself, the city and the housing developments around it. The neighborhood of a 60,000 populated place at that time. On the west coast, it was the biggest, of course, industrial city. We went from there to Gander, which is at the northern part, to get to St. John's on the only one road that reached from Port of Bass to Argentia Naval Station way over on the southwest coast, I beg your pardon, southeast coast of Newfoundland. the lake above Cornerbrook. Now this is the Pickering Hotel. Mr. and Ms. Pickering became very good friends of ours. We enjoyed them tremendously. In fact, Gay played the music for their daughter's wedding and they got us into the country club there in Cornerbrook, which made life sort of enjoyable, as it was in the largest log hut at that time in the world. And this is Gay and I coming out of the, or Gay rather, coming out of the country club. Now we're back at Stephenville Crossing at the lake where it's iced over and the kids are all going skating. And they really did a lot of skating in the wintertime around that area. And this is where the pulpwood logs were floated down just in time in the fall of the year to freeze up so they could be picked up by clam and put on the railroad and shipped up to Cornerbrook when the spring fall came around. It's a way to make a living, though, because pulpwood was one of the biggest industries in Newfoundland after fishing, of course. Come from ice skating in the wintertime back to work on our butler buildings in the salvage yard at Ernest Harmon Air Force Base in 1953 when we first started this project. That was where they were getting ready to pour a concrete floor. Of course, you always have to have NCOs in charge. Quite a bit of leveling, smoothing of the ground, of course, had taken place here.
We did have a little scrap left, which we tried to carefully keep piled up. Again, now we're having to use tents so that any like cement, when it rained or snowed, didn't get wet and ruined. That equipment was rather expensive, but we had to have it. Here we're building a, an orderly room as well as a command post so we can operate out of it reasonably. I'm getting a report from a sergeant there. And we had to move some old buildings that were had the space to make the salvage yard as well as road. So we didn't have enough money to buy new lumber. So we had to take out the nails and use them. Here we're starting to pour the footings and foundations on the butlers using 14 sack concrete mixers as well as we did have access to the concrete plant that we could have enough money occasionally to buy six cubic yard truckload. Boy, we poured a lot of concrete that day. There goes our first butler frame raised. Yes, it took a lot of water. A lot of crushed gravel and sand. And a lot of physical effort with those wheelbarrows. And I have not speeded up this eight millimeter movie. We made those guys work that rapidly. We had to. Here we are pushing the rock that we had hauled in from wherever I could find it to the 150 ton rock crusher down by Noel's Pond as this is here so we could get our aggregate as well as our sand to mix for the concrete. That's the 150 ton we're pushing rock into. It was a lovely country if you can forget to work. You may get tired of looking at this, but you should try to think how tired we got doing it. Here comes a load of rock that we had gotten on the side of the road that we were trying to build, a bypass road. It was cheaper than buying it. And we did have mounds of it that we could haul when we needed it. We did have to do most of our rock crushing during the time we didn't have snow and ice because it's literally impossible to do it, not because a crusher wouldn't work, but because we would have killed men or broken their legs and slipped and fallen. It was a safety hazard. We could not do that during the actual snow periods. We're getting our building so we can have an orderly room. More piles of gravel down by 
the Tyler Breslin Company out of Kentucky had this asphalt plant that they were furnishing all the asphalt for J.A. Jones Construction Company out of Charlotte, North Carolina, who had the contract to add a new 10,000-foot runway and build quite a few buildings. This was their area where we were occasionally able to get enough money to buy some of the stuff. Well, I made a horse trade with their equipment manager there. I had some equipment he didn't. He had some that I didn't. So we charged each other and rented from each other, but never passed a dime. However, we both kept records because we knew that sooner or later, somebody would hang both of us because you can't rent in the military. That would have been me get hung. And you can't use it from the civilian life, that would have been him getting hung. But poor old Jack, instead of getting hung, he got fooled. Not Jack, excuse me, that was King. <laughs> See, it took a long time to do anything in Newfoundland. We haven't even put a little bridge across here, covered across there. Forms, we had to keep oiled in order for the cement not to stick to them when we took them off after the footings and walls had hardened. 